I'm Tim Potts, the director of the J. Paul Getty Museum, and it is a, um, a great pleasure, privilege, to have Edmund Duval uh, with us tonight uh, to talk about his new book and his new uh, projects. Um, it's, I think what he's achieved through his um, uh, career so far uh, in his stature as an artist, as a potter, and as a writer, I think is absolutely extraordinary. And it's, you have to think very hard to, I think, even approach what he's done in the uh, eminence he's reached and the distinguished nature of his contribution to um, the visual arts, and also as a best-selling writer of a really serious literary level um, that um, it's, I think, actually unique in amongst contemporary artists working today, certainly in the Western world. And I'm delighted that he can be here today. It's his second time speaking at the Getty. He spoke in 2010 on his first book, uh, The Hair with Amber Eyes, um, which has been such a runaway success, as is the new book, um, uh, clearly giving every indication of being also. And I'm delighted on a personal level because I had the opportunity to work with him in Cambridge and uh, got to know him and his work uh, there, and it's very nice uh, So for me. His work is well known, and I'm not going to say much about it because you're much better to see it in his lecture, but he's been collected in a number of the uh, very most major museums in his home uh, country in Britain, uh, at the Victoria and Albert, the preeminent uh, museum of the, uh, applied arts in the UK, uh, at others in, um, in Britain at the Fitzwilliam, where I was both previously, at the Ashmolean, uh, here in this country at the Museum of Fine Arts in Houston, uh, at the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam, and as far afield, indeed, as the World Ceramic Exposition Museum in Korea. And many of those, and this is, of course, only a small number of the museums that have collected his work, and those and many others have also, uh, of course, shown exhibitions of his work and uh, installations, or as they're sometimes called, interventions, where his work is... Uh, uh, brought into the spaces uh, with the permanent collections in interesting and stimulating ways. And indeed, that's how we first got to know each other uh, in 2012 or 2013, uh, when Edmund was doing one of these interventions, uh, what was eventually um, in 2013, took place as uh, on white porcelain stories from the Fitzwilliam. And the Fitzwilliam, um, is a rather special place uh, for him because it's where he grew up and uh, as he explained to me, uh, his, some of his earliest memories of understanding and exposure and interest in art came from being in its collections. When I first met um, Edmund, I was struck by um, his insistence that he be described as a potter. And I thought that was rather interesting because not only does it reflect the, the modesty of the man, which you see, um, in his character and in his writing and so on. Um, but also, in a subtle way, it seemed to me actually to be asserting the artistry of potting. Because if you do understand the history of the medium, and you'll be hearing a lot more about it, of course, tonight from him, um, and the extraordinary technical uh, achievement that it represents, particularly with porcelain, um, and the extraordinary craftsmanship and artistry that goes into it, it shouldn't and doesn't need the word art in the title. You don't have to call yourself a ceramic artist, as most potters do these days. Um, if you really understand what being a potter is at this level, it shouldn't need the word art to be explicitly mentioned. So it's in a say, I took it really as a, um, a, a reinforcement of the fact that being a potter, in a sense, doesn't need any further um, passing for you to understand its importance, certainly when it's at um, this level of sophistication. My one little personal anecdote: um, the work that we were, uh, the project that we worked on, and that um, took place at the Fitzwilliam, coincided with his interest in uh, porcelain, and indeed the coming together uh, led to uh, a, jo a trip uh, by Edmund to Jindajiang, the source of porcelain manufacturing in China, with members of the Fitzwilliam uh, Museum. Unfortunately, I couldn't go at the time, but. Uh, and this is not a work by Edmund Duval, but from my perspective, it's the next best thing because it is um, the work of one of the potters at Jindajang that Edmund kindly selected 
and was given to me. So I'm now the proud owner of this um, work from Jindajung in China, which has an Edmund de Waal, um, more than an Edmund, an Edmund de Waal taste involved in its selection. A few words, uh, if I may, just before uh, ceding the, the podium to him. I mentioned, of course, how extraordinary it is that someone should reach the eminence he has, both as an artist and as a writer, and how rare this is uh, in our time and indeed in art history generally. But in his case, I think it does form a very uh, natural pairing. And when it, now that it's happened, you can really see in both of the areas of endeavor how much really his approach to them does hang together and makes absolute sense. Uh, much of his writing, in particularly The Hair with Amber Eyes, has been about the layers, the multiple layers of meaning that objects, the materiality, the objects carry and betray, if you understand them, the meanings that they're invested with by their makers, the meaning of the patrons, and then the subsequent owners. Uh, sometimes the loss of the object invests it with other meaning for those who used to own them, and then, of course, if they can be restituted. This was all, of course, part of the story of the Netskis um, that were secreted in the, the mattress in Vienna in, by the maid to Edmund's uh, family in, uh, during the Nazi years, and is the core of that earlier book. His art, likewise, is extremely pure. Um, in fact, sometimes I'd like to think actually rather misleadingly so. It's sometimes called minimalist, although I don't see it actually as being minimalist, min minimalist so much as it is very purist. Uh, but it's deceptively so, because it is the purity of his objects, usually monochrome, sometimes a very simple white glaze, a simple cylindrical form. But invested in that is all the history, the extraordinary technical achievement that it was to create this magic material, which we call porcelain. Um, and it often was in the most humble seeming objects. But as I say, behind that humility and simplicity is an extraordinary technical, artistic, and um, craftsmanship that is anything but simple. The second point I'd like to make is that I think his, both his art and his writing is very much an exercise in juxtaposition. The works of art that he creates from individual vessels, you often in a particular framing or in this particular space and time, the, the, the work of art is a combination of these elements at a point in time and in a space defined by the frame or the vitrine or whatever, which goes way beyond the individual significance of the individual pieces. It's all about the selection, the arrangement, the juxtaposition. And of course, it's the same in history and in the narratives that he tells. The events that, uh, the, that he portrays and retraces through the journeys and the research has been about particular people, particular episodes, but it's the juxtaposition of those people, those objects, and the objects, of course, are always at the center, being at that place and that point in time that come together with often momentous, well, in some cases, momentous consequences, whether they be good or bad, and technical or historical, and so on, and personal. In all of this, of course, he takes us on a, a journey in which it is, as I said, the objects that carry either the bounty or the burden of that history. And that's what makes his writing as much about art as does, as is indeed the works that he makes themselves. And he's always reminding us that objects have lives as much, in a way, as we do. They're just different and they don't declare themselves um, to us as obviously. The last point I'll make, um, I think what for so much of us is so wonderful about Edmund's work is the poetry of it. And this is again, is both in the character of the, um, the pots that he makes and also of his writing. His art is rather gentle. It suggests, it gestures, and, uh, and it seduces rather than trying to describe or declare or persuade us of something. And this is a, quite a rare quality in today's contemporary art world where so much art is so strident and demonstrative and in one way or another rather in your face. It is very contemplative. 
It's, um, as I said before, very purist, as I say, not minimalist, because it's not the slick, sharp, technical minimalism that we conjure up by that term. In fact, the perfection of his work is all about its imperfections. It's the slight um, uh, wobbles around the, the rim of the vessel or the corrugations of the, the coiling. It's, it's the very handcrafted quality of it that gives it its human dimension. As I say, it's the imperfections that make it as perfect as it is. And likewise in his writing about complexity and beauty and meaning and the objects that carry them. These are often things that are hidden, that are not declared, but they are gleaned if, you, if they can be and divined. And it's always a journey that he takes us on um, and a wonderful journey and an enlightening um, journey as indeed the subtitle of this latest book indicates the journey to an obsession or of an obsession. So without further ado, I'll invite Edmund to take us on that journey and um, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much, Tim. That was hugely generous. I'm even more nervous than I was before. <laughs> and believe me, I was pretty nervous to begin with, because it's quite something to stand in this space, in this place uh, with all of you here, uh, to tell you about this particular journey. Where do you start? I start in my studio. I walk through my space, an old ammunition factory in a not very nice bit of South London. And I walk past this space in which I put out an installation if I want to look at it hard, and I reach a staircase there are two staircases in my studio. One goes up here. It goes up to a small space with a wheel. And this is where I make pots. I've been making pots for 45 out of my 51 years. When I was a very small child, I persuaded my father, an Anglican priest, an Episcopalian minister, I'll translate for you, <laughs> to take me to an evening class in the local art college. And at the local art college, Lincoln, I went down the stairs with him into the cellar for, for some obscure cultural reason. Potters are always put in cellars. It's very mysterious. And there was a wheel, and I sat down, and I was five, and I made my first pot on an electric wheel, and it was dreadful. <laughs> but there was something totally, utterly mesmeric about having a lump of clay, this heavy, inchoate, dense material, and throwing it down onto this wheelhead, and then making a form, feeling this clay come alive in my hands. And the next week, I went back down those stairs, and there was my pot, slightly smaller and fired. And the teacher said to me, now, dear, I can remember the dear, what color do you want to make it? There are all these beautiful colors. You can have purple and red and blue and green and black. You can have all the colors of the rainbow. And I glazed it white. And 45 years later, I'm still making white pots. <laughs> and the subtitle of my book is from Melville. What is this thing? of whiteness, because I come up here to my slightly monastic place in which I make porcelain bowls, porcelain vessels. And that's what I think about. What is this thing 
of whiteness, or I go up the other staircase in my studio where I have a space with books. This is far too scrubbed and clean. It's never nearly as glamorous as this. It's been done for a magazine. It's piles of books, it's piles of papers, and it's porcelain shards, broken bits of porcelain, two staircases, one up to clay, the other up to books and words. But in both spaces, I write like a five-year-old on the walls all the notes, all the ideas about what I want to make, what I want to write. And as I tipped towards middle age, to my crisis, I was thinking about all those decades of sitting, trying to still the world a little by making white porcelain objects. And I thought, if I don't go now on my pilgrimage to try and work out why I was still doing this, if I didn't go on pilgrimage to the three white hills in the world, the three places where porcelain was made or remade, thought about or invented or reinvented, then I would never do it. I would be in my old age and I would never have gone on this journey. And so here is my list of places and people for my white road, London, Plymouth, Venice, Dresden, Cornwall, Stoke, Jingdezhen, the city where it all starts, Istanbul, Dublin, North Carolina, Beijing, Alach, West Norwood. West Norwood is my suburban suburb where I make the pots. And then Rome crossed out. I can't remember why I crossed Rome out, but I didn't get to Rome. But that's my journey. And it all looked so simple a list of places I needed to go. But to go anywhere, and particularly to go on a journey to three white hills, these three special places, you need a guide. And I chose, I have to say, and I'm going to sound insufferably English and smug incredibly well, I chose a Jesuit. Now, Jesuits are really good guides. This is advice for free. Jesuits are very tidy and very good at note-taking. So for my first trip to Jingdezhen, under the auspices of, as Tim says, of the Fitzwilliam Museum, I took with me this extraordinary man, Father Dontrecol, a 17th century Jesuit, a Frenchman, born in a peasant family in Limoges, where my clay comes from, who set off as a young man and was sent, like all the Jesuits were in the 17th century, to go off to extraordinary places and turn the heathens towards the Lord and also to write down in incredible detail about what they see and smell and hear. And my father, Dantrecol, this young Frenchman who said halfway through his journey that he died He'd rather die than continue on this dreadful journey to China, arrives in the city of Jingdezhen, the city of porcelain, and he begins to take notes of all the things he sees around him, this city of, of clay and kilns, of glazes and people. And these are his notes. So to go to Jingdezhen, I photocopy, I have to say rather preciously, all his notes and carry them off to Jingdezhen. And on my first day in this humid Chinese city, I go up the mountain, Mount Kaolin, the, the, the clay mountain where porcelain comes from. And I go up into these damp hills, these dense, damp hills, and I look down under my feet, and there is a Sung Dynasty bowl a broken shard of a Chinese celadon pot under my feet, cracking under my feet. And this is my great epiphany, 45 years, and there I am on my first morning. And I shout out to my guides, this is it, this is it. And they can't understand while they're all laughing at me. And they're laughing at me because the whole bloody hillside <laughs> 
is millions and millions and millions of broken pots. It's a landscape of porcelain. This is a tidal slip of broken porcelain. Everywhere here, under your feet, are broken pots, because this is what porcelain does. Porcelain goes wrong. This is my kinship with these pots from a thousand years ago, because when you pick up the clay that you have laboriously mined from these hills, you get imperfections into it, and it goes wrong. You pick it up to throw it, and it warps in your hands and moves like an Art Deco figure, and it goes wrong. You put it in the kiln, and my god, it cracks. You try and glaze it, and it all goes wrong. It's a millennium of things going wrong. This is my kind of place. <laughs> and down from this extraordinary hill, this white hill where porcelain was discovered a thousand years ago, here they are carrying the clay down towards the city. And it's a city which, here in a wonderful 1920s photograph by a journalist, it was described in, in, in the Sung Dynasty by a really uh, plaintive poet. Actually, Chinese poets are often very plaintive. He's a particularly plaintive poet who hated being there. And he said, by night, it's hell. All the kilns are, are like the mouth of hell with, with flames coming up. And by day, you cannot see anything for the smoke. He really had a very bad time there. But actually, in this extraordinary city, Jingdezhen, my wonderful Jesuit guide talks about seeing everywhere people making pots. He talks about people making them. He talks about people grinding the cobalt to make that extraordinary, dense, blue-black color, which turns porcelain into storytelling. And he talks about all the cries of the people wheeling and carrying these great groups of porcelain through the streets. And there, in the streets, aren't these dreadful? These extraordinary cartloads of porcelain going everywhere. This is a man who I, my heart was in my mouth as he bumped this porcelain along the roads. But it's a city which has porcelain in its blood. You look through the courtyards and you see extraordinary objects. Ursat's great Ming Dynasty vases being made for the hotels of Dubai. You see <laughs> children making this stuff. And I went into this workshop and I asked these kids, 16, 17, and they're paying paid enough, this girl said, for, for, for her mobile phone and a packet of cigarettes a day. And wherever you go, you see dust. Because that's the great thing about porcelain. When you make white pots out of this porcelain clay, every time you touch it, every time you scrape down a pot, every time you put that pot in a kiln, there is white dust. The dust is silica. It enters your lungs. It's called potter's rot. Everywhere you go, you see white dust. What is this thing of whiteness? What is this whiteness doing to you? What it's doing, of course, here is making things of unbelievable, incendiary beauty. This is a pot, a monk's cap ewer. This is my first white pot of my book, of my pilgrimage. A monk's cap ewer made for the Emperor Yongle, an extraordinary and terrifying early, early Chinese emperor who created the Forbidden City, who moved mountains, literally, who sent fleets around the world, who massacred tens of thousands of people, but loved white porcelain. He is my first obsessional white lover of porcelain. He loved Tibetan Buddhism. He also killed thousands of people. And in his devotion to white, his obsession with white, he created for his late parents a pagoda of white porcelain, a pagoda of 275 feet high in the middle of Nanjing, 
and there were lamps put every evening to light up the whole of the pagoda, and the bells would ring, and this white object, imagine it, just imagine this extraordinary object in the middle of a city, a white object of devotion and grief, an object of obsessional power. This extraordinary porcelain pagoda, who sees it? Everyone sees it. And the person who sees it and writes about it best is my French Jesuit, Père d'Entrecourt. And he writes these letters home about how to make porcelain, and he writes about the extraordinary scale of the porcelain he's seen. And his letters go all the way back to Paris, to Versailles. They get translated into every language. But the person who reads them with the most avidity is another obsessive. It's Louis XIV. And he decides that if an emperor in China can have buildings made out of porcelain, well, damn it, he too can have his own porcelain building. And so he builds for Madame de Montespan, who is his current squeeze, his current mistress, the Trianon de Porcelain. And here it is, it's 20 minutes walk from Versailles. And they can't make porcelain in Europe, so he uses Delftware. He uses white pots made down the road in Holland, blue and white, and can you see all those urns and vases clustered on the roof scapes? And the whole of this building is made with tiles, but Madame de Montespan hates it. <laughs> it's damp. It's not big enough for her. And Delftware cracks in French rain. But it's the first attempt, obsessive attempt, to try and make a different kind of porcelain object in the world. And before it's turn, turned into shards, a young man on his travels, on his Vanderjeer, on his gap year, comes to pay homage to this extraordinary building. And this is my second man I fell in love with, very unlikely person to fall in love with, not for looks. This <laughs> is my other hero, my second hero of my journey. He's a young German philosopher. He's a, a penniless count. Walter Ehrenheide von Chernhaus. And he's a man, he's a very strange man to fall in love with. As a child, he discovered a love of mathematics. He was a brilliant mathematician. He loved the way that you could make the world conjure itself into equations and balance. And he went off on his travels with mathematics in his head, and he went to sit at the feet of Spinoza and Leibniz and Newton. And this, I have to say, in a slightly idiotic and I have to say also very obsessional way that I do things, I, I bought at vast expense his first Latin treatise on mathematics. I can't read Latin, and I don't know anything about mathematics, and it cost me about half my advance for the book, but I had to have it in my hand. But, but he, he, this is it, this is, this is beauty, this is real beauty. But he took himself off to see Newton, and Newton sketched this extraordinary thing about how light bends. And at the feet of Spinoza, the great philosopher, he learned how to grind lenses. And he discovered that he had a talent for making lenses, for understanding how light bends and how heat works. And this incredible and beautiful lens, you have to leave here immediately and go to Dresden, where this incredible thing is. It's almost as big as that. It's absolutely, ex no, I'm totally exaggerating here. It's half the size of that. It's very big, this auditorium, Tim. It's very impressive. Half the size of that screen is this beautiful lens, and you come towards it. You really do have to go and see it. It's absolutely extraordinary. And the whole world changes. It's like Alice in Wonderland. It's amazing. But with this lens, Chernhaus realizes that he can look at materials and begin to understand how materials work. And he has a dream, a dream from looking at that failed Trianon 
de porcelain that he is going to understand and make porcelain, be the first person in Europe to crack this extraordinary arcanum, this mystery of how porcelain is made. And so he takes these great lenses and he goes to the city where he knows he can get patronage. He goes to Dresden. And this is Dresden. The year he goes there, there's the Elba, there's Dresden. And Dresden is in color. Dresden is gold. Dresden is glamour because it's ruled over by this ridiculous man, Augustus the Strong, Alexa of Saxony. The man according to, 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 the, to the reports of the day, a man of appetite. A man of appetite means that he had, when he died, 212 illegitimate children. A man who would entertain his guests after dinner by bending horseshoes with his bare hands, or going out for a spot of badger tossing, which means throwing badgers up into the air for entertainment. But a man above all, when he's not doing all those other things, who has a self-declared porcelain krankenheit, a madness for porcelain, the maladie de porcelain. He has, when he inherits the Saxony, 32 pieces of porcelain in the imperial treasury, and when he dies, he has 32,768 pieces of porcelain. In Dresden, he wants porcelain. He sends people to Amsterdam to buy whole shiploads of porcelain. He wants to send his own boats down the Elbe all the way to Jingdezhen to buy porcelain before anyone else can buy it. Why does he want porcelain? Porcelain, for him, is otherness, strangeness. It's a dream. It's a dream of, of elsewhere. It's imperial in scale. It's a material that is neither one thing nor another, but beyond all. You can see light through it. It weighs nothing. It tells stories. Why would you not have the madness of porcelain? And Chernhaus comes to tell him that he can make it, this young philosopher, but he can't. But then there's a rumor that in Berlin, a young alchemist, a young man called Bertger. I really dislike this man. It's not necessarily just the open shirt, though that's a bit of a problem for me. I think it's the, he is the most appalling person to have to spend the last five years of my life with. But Bertger, this young man, has discovered the Philosopher's Stone. He's changed lead into gold. And cleverly, Augustus kidnaps this young man and brings him to Dresden. And he's locked up in the cellars of the castle in Meissen. And here are the cellars of Meissen. Uh, and you think, well, that's you know, bad luck. But I have to say, having read this, which are his accounts and complaints, you know, I still even think that locking him up was still about right, actually, I have to say. But between them, this alchemist and this philosopher start to trial different materials. They begin to put these different materials together in order to try. There are volumes of these complaints. There are absolute volumes of them. And, and don't get me started on the archivists of, of, of Dresden. I, I, sorry, I'm going to lose my way. They spend years trialing in order to try and find white porcelain, and they finally make this porcelain. And it's beautiful, and it's wrong, but they're on their way. They've discovered how to build kilns that can get to the right temperature, begin to compound materials. And here is the wonderful notes from the day in where they find number five. They're bringing different materials together. If you look down to number five, Optime Album et Pellucidum, the best white and translucent. 1708, they open the kiln and they've made this. They've made the first porcelain in Europe. And it's beautiful. It's so beautiful. And Chernhaus, my lovely philosopher, my errant philosopher, writes that it's as beautiful as a narcissus, 
which I have to say is so touching. And there it is. It's made. They've cracked the arcanum. They can make porcelain for Augustus the Strong. And two days later, Chernhaus dies. And his papers have disappeared. And his books have disappeared. And Bertger goes to see Augustus the Strong and says, I am the inventor of European porcelain. And there he is. And Meissen is invented. The crossed blue rapiers in cobalt are put on the basis of all these extraordinary pots made in this Saxon porcelain manufactory. They've done it. It's the second White Hill. But what do they do with porcelain? They make this. <laughs> so you have it and you don't have it at the same time. <laughs> and I have to say, there's quite a lot of this in your place, too. <laughs> For my third White Hill, I'm in England. This is the end of England, land's end. For my third White Hill, I'm following my third hero, my third unlikely avatar, the third discoverer of porcelain, the man who discovered English porcelain. And he was an English apothecary, a man called William Cookworth. I didn't choose them for their looks, <laughs> but my God, I loved this man. He was an extraordinary talker, to people. Quakers are very noisy. It's one of the great mysteries about Quakers. Everyone thinks they're totally silent as the grave. But the more time you spend with the Quakers, the more you realize how noisy they are. And Cookworthy was a great conversationalist. He went as a young man to live in Plymouth, which is staggeringly wet. His neighbor was uh, 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 the man with the first English barometer. And, and, and so all the time that Cookworthy in his long life lived in Plymouth, his neighbor was writing down every day, rain, a greater rain, even greater rain. <laughs> but there was nothing to do in Plymouth, in the rain, except read. And he reads those letters of that extraordinary Jesuit. And as he goes with his horse, Prudence, you couldn't make it up, all around the English countryside to visit his aged relatives and preach in Quaker meeting houses. He thinks about the clay and the ground under his feet. And up on this hill, Trigoning Hill, talking to the tinners, the people who are mining there, he takes the white clay and he takes it home to his modest house in Plymouth. And he starts to make notes. And he makes more notes, and then he builds a little kiln. And then he starts to experiment. And here are his first shards. I was in, uh, in, a, in, a, in an archive in the middle of nowhere, Truro, nowhere. And I open this letter, and for the first time since 1764, this letter is opened, and out fall these broken porcelain shards. He says, this is my idea of porcelain. And it takes him years and years and years. And then finally, 1768, March the 14th, Cookworthy Feckett, CF, out of that little kiln comes the first piece of English porcelain, and it's a beer mug. It's a beer tankard. Can you believe it? With the arms of Plymouth in cobalt, really badly painted so they've run, but it's noble effort. It weighs an absolute ton. <laughs> and there, William Kirkworthy's factory in Plymouth. He's done it. And here he is, reading scripture in his chair, because he's a contemplative man who loved porcelain. And then he makes the most terrible, catastrophic error. He decides he's going to get a patent. 40 years it's taken him. He's damn well going to get, he wouldn't say that word, 
a patent, and as soon as he publishes his patent, all the way down from Stoke-on-Trent, the beady eye of Josiah Wedgwood falls on my Plymouth chemist. And Wedgwood is many things, the first industrialist, the greatest potter ever, etc., etc., etc. But he's also a total bastard because he decides that he is going to crush the patent and crush Cookworthy. And he does. He totally destroys William Cookworthy. And what's more, he hears from Cookworthy that there's been seen all the way across the world in Carolina, in the colonies, in Cherokee country, a particular kind of white clay. And so because, amongst all the other things that Wedgwood does, he's indomitable, Wedgwood sends an adventurer, Thomas Griffiths, a ne'er-do-well man with no money, all the way across the world into Cherokee country, into the hills of the Appalachians, to a particular hillside where Cherokee Indians have been using kaolin clay, porcelain clay, for ritual purposes and to cover the insides of tents and structures to make them white, to make beautiful white spaces. And he sits down with these Indians and he makes a terrible bargain that he will take five tons of their precious sacred clay away, but will return the next year with porcelain tankards for them. And he takes away five tons of their clay and disappears for good. This is the hillside, and this is the last piece of clay there. And Wedgwood uses this clay he makes things of beauty. There's Cherokee clay in the extraordinary Wedgwood service that's made for Catherine the Great. But Wedgwood knows so much. He knows how to make clay work. And so Cornwall becomes this. Cornwall gets eviscerated for kaolin, and people start to move towards Cornwall just to create these blocks of kaolin. And kaolin clay is taken all the way back on the new canals to Stoke-on-Trent, which becomes the new Jingdezhen. It becomes the city of white pots. It becomes the city where you look through the doorways and children are making pots. And that, I thought, was that, idiotically. I thought I'd done my three heroes, my three white pots, my three white hills. I thought that was enough of a pilgrimage. I thought, idiotically, that I would end my book with this beautiful, extraordinary teapot made during the Russian Revolution by Malevich, by the great suprematist radical thinker about what white means. That, I thought, was a bloody good end to a book. End on Malevich. But then, because I can't sleep, because I drink too much black coffee, in the middle of the night, I was checking up, obsessionally, on the kilns of Germany in the 1920s, tracking down my famous favorite Bauhaus designer, Wilhelm Wagenfeld. I thought I would just give him a look. And in the list of factories of Germany in the 1920s and 30s, I find that Wagenfeld, a great hero of mine, had worked in a factory called Alach. And because I didn't know Alach, I start to look it up, and I find that it was in the suburb of Munich, established in 1936. So I go there, and I find the derelict factory on the suburb of Munich, called Alach. And I find that this young, interesting porcelain factory was set up by the SS to make white porcelain 
for the functionaries of the new Reich, and that Allach porcelain was so successful that in 1940 it's moved from this derelict factory to Dachau concentration camp. That Himmler, who loved porcelain, Himmler, who was another obsessive over white porcelain, wanted it so much that he too wanted his own porcelain factory. And what better place for Himmler to have a porcelain factory was Dachau, where he could visit and bring colleagues to look and pick up and examine the new porcelain for the new Reich. Because porcelain, of course, is, quotes, a good German material. Because porcelain's whiteness is the whiteness of the new Reich. It's an Aryan material. Because with porcelain, you can make figures as great as any made in Meissen. But what do you make? You make peasants, you make animals, and you make figures of Nazis. Here is the figure of the fencer, which was only given to the commandants of concentration camps. It is Heydrich who started the final solution with his favorite object made in a concentration camp out of this pure, beautiful, white clay, an object of contemplation, an object of beauty. Here is Himmler giving presents to Hitler on his birthday, new objects from Dachau. So I go to Dachau, and I go to that archive, and I read the account books and the letters, and I try and work out where this kind of porcelain takes me. And the archivist says, we've just got in a new figure that's been given to us that was made here in the camp. And they bring out one of those plastic laundry boxes with things wrapped in newspaper. And I think, what's it going to be? And I unwrap it, and it's Bambi. <laughs> it's kitsch of the most horrific kind. And I pick it up and turn it over as you do. And there is the signature of Allah. It's Meissen's double swords turned into the SS runes. How do you deal with that? It's obsession. What is this thing of whiteness? And I'm finishing this journey, and I can't finish the journey. And I have an invitation as I'm trying to write about what this means, about this kind of territory that I have unexpectedly found myself in. And I have an invitation from Vienna to make something, an installation, an intervention for a building on the Ringstrasse for the Theseus Temple. A white building. Now, as some of you may know, Vienna is a complicated place for me. But, damn it, I'm not going to turn down an invitation to make something for this space in Vienna. It's opposite the Kunsthistorische Museum. It's in the great plaza, the great Volksgarten, where Hitler at the Anschluss addressed 100,000 people. It was made for a Canova sculpture, a white sculpture. And it's now, every year, they invite an artist to make a piece and put it in this building. And the doors are open, and people can wander in for a year. But what do you make for Vienna? 
and I made this. I made a pair of vitrines because vitrines also have a resonance for Vienna, for me. Vitrines are places where objects are held safely. They're kinds of liminal spaces where things happen. And a pair of vitrines, and this is what they are, I called it Lichtzwang, two words brought together by the great poet Celan, the great poet in German of the 20th century, whose parents died in the Holocaust, whose poetry anatomizes the German language and anatomizes how you write about what it is to survive. And he wrote a poem about the complexity of white. White was a difficult color for him. White, he said, was the color my mother's hair never reached. White is the homecoming, the heimkehr I can never do. So I wrote on the wall his poem in English and in German, and in these vitrines, I put white pots, some of them with tiny glimpses of silver. It's a poem, a poem with porcelain. It's two pages of a book. It's porcelain in vitrines. And that's the first piece that I brought here to LA from Vienna, Lichtswang. And I make this piece, and there it is for a year, and people wander in, and the Viennese critics hate it, and mums come in with their kids when it's raining, and tramps with bottles of wine, and a not very good dance troupe make a not a very nice thing about it, but that's fine. But it's there, in Vienna, for a year, Lichtswang. And then I'm back in my studio, and I think, what can I do after making this? And so I make another piece, which is the other side of this, and that's Black Milk. It's another poem of Celan, Black Milk of the Daybreak. It's from his great poem, Death Fugue. And this is my second Celan poem. Black milk, white that has been turned black. These are my black vessels. They're metallic and dark. They're all about the shadows because what I'm starting to do and come out about what I do is to make poetry. What I'm doing is bringing vessels together in spaces and bringing them in to constellations and groupings, bringing in caesuras and pauses and moments of energy, bringing all kinds of different rhythms together so that when you see objects in these spaces, in these vitrines, in these shelves. And when you walk along them, when you look along a whole installation, you get rhythms as of reading poetry. It can be Celan, it can be Wallace Stevens, it can be anyone, but that's what I'm doing. And it's poetry, but for me, I'm also saying now, that it is a kind of music. Because when I make pots and when I see them, I hear them. There is a kind of quality of sound for me around these objects. And so what I'm doing with these kinds of new pieces is to make a kind of transcription, a kind of score you can read them or hear them or look at them. They do these things. So my other invitation that happened as I was finishing my journey of the White Road was to make an exhibition for Los Angeles. And for me, Los Angeles is people and particular places, real grounded people and places. And my first person was John Cage, who grew up here. And Cage is the master for me, has been for ages and ages and ages, of how you record fugitive sound, how you understand and make sense of poetry, 
make scores that can be read and invested and brought to life in all kinds of ways, and how you can deal with silence and make silence happen in extraordinary public ways. Four minutes, 33, tacit, tacit, tacit. So Cage, for me, is the person who I associate with this place, with LA, because he is the person who I want to talk about when I come to this extraordinary city. And when I was thinking about Cage and reading him and listening to him, I was also thinking about this place, this extraordinary, catalytic place where all these different kinds of conversation across the boundaries between music and poetry. Charles Olson writing about lines of poetry, generative lines of poetry, cage making music, art and work happening together, the new art of the East coming together in this extraordinary way, being introduced to painters so that Zen poetry is brought in contact with Rauschenberg, with Gottlieb making these extraordinary marks, and with dance, with the whole idea of the mark as someone in motion, Merce Cunningham in mid-air, in this extraordinary series of photographs, where the body is in space, where the line seems endless. This is the kind of experience that I get from reading and thinking about Cage, the man who, with Rauschenberg, put a sheet of paper down on a street in New York and got a tire, an automobile, to make the longest line they ever could make. Cage and L.A. So for coming to L.A., I make a piece for Cage. It's called The 10,000 Things, brackets for John Cage. I want to make it bloody clear, it's for him. And it's 20 aluminium boxes. And in each of them, as I put them up in my studio, I put Corten steel, this new material for me. I put it down and it's percussive. One piece, two pieces, five pieces of Corten steel, and then these new black glazes round them, these objects, so that you can walk along this whole series, this whole installation, and hear my approach to music. This is the 10,000 things for John Cage. But then as I read and read and read in the middle of the night about this man, I discovered that he had actually lived in my favorite building in LA. How cool is that? The Schindler House, <laughs> the place made by the great Viennese emigre, Rudolf Schindler. Here he is looking like a wonderful Rue, the man that's a proper moustache, if you ever have it. And here with Pauline Schindler, who Cage had this great, wonderful love affair, wrote these tremendous letters for. This is where Schindler invents modernism in LA. He builds this house for the two families. He builds this extraordinary building where work, where the studio and the living spaces flow from one space to another, where the doors are open to LA, where light comes in, in all kinds of ways. It's a beautiful, beautiful house. It's also a place where materials, for me, are investigated and interrogated in an incredibly powerful way. So for LA, for Schindler, I make these pieces where Corten steel floats like a beam in the Schindler house where porcelain is held in mid-air and I make a new kind of vitrine, a vitrine which sits out in the world. Because what Schindler does in his extraordinary house, in this great, ridiculous, metabolic way of bringing spaces together, is to make us look how we move through space. And that's art. How do you move through space? So for this show, for this exhibition, for LA, I make a piece called A New Ground. I take this, I think about it, I think about it for another year, and then I make this series of vitrines. These are my newest work. Five or six vitrines brought together that you can look around and see through, which are my 
affectionate move towards Schindler by saying that actually vitrines and buildings, pots and people, materials and memories are very, very closely aligned. And then finally, because I'm English, I make something about the weather. <laughs> I find out that late in life, Cage had made a piece called A Lecture on the Weather. So I look obsessively, because I am an obsessive, about the LA weather, and I make you this. <laughs> and it's bloody good, because if you look on the 12th of January, which is the second one along on this close-up, I got it right. That's your weather today. <laughs> that's your sky. So that's my lecture on your weather. And that's my white road. You make porcelain, you pick it up, and somewhere along the line, it ends up as this, as the first thing I picked up on that hillside in Jingdezhen. But shards matter because they're history. You pick it up and you start another kind of journey. Thank you. <laughs>